Hey everybody, this is question and answer time number 29. I'm your host, Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Marcus Vinicius Marchiori writes, Did you watch the Leonard Bernstein lectures at Harvard by any chance? Yeah, over the course of me running this channel, I've been recommended that lecture series that Leonard Bernstein gave at Harvard. They called it the Norton Lectures. I'm not really quite sure why they're called the Norton Lectures, but they're really awesome. It's basically Leonard Bernstein giving this whole spiel on the history of music and how music came to be through the lens of grammar. He was very influenced by Noam Chomsky and his idea of universal grammar, and the entire entire lecture series is online for free on YouTube. What a wonderful, crazy, brave new world we live in. But I strongly recommend you check that out. And fun fact, actually, hold on, let me see if I can't find it real quick. I was able to find this online, and you might be able to find it too on Amazon with this Mount Rushmore looking thing. It's pretty amazing. I've never really checked out anything quite like it. And if you really dig like the sort of ideas that I talk about on my channel, you're going to really love the Bernstein Norton lectures. Uh, definitely check them out. Links are in the description. Azen Marn writes, the fingering looks fast forwarded. That's because it was fast forwarded. I thought I was making this little tongue in cheek joke. I used image masking so that I made it so that the left side of the screen was playing at normal speed and the right side was playing at double speed. That's usually how those kinds of videos are faked with the clocks and everything going. So it makes you believe that, hey, it's done in real time. Unfortunately, a lot of people thought that it was playing it for real, which definitely I wasn't. So sorry about that. Wyatt Rydelsky writes, Hey, loaded series of questions. How do these gigs work? Are you in a consistent slash permanent fixture in these projects you are documenting on these vlogs? If so, what happens when multiple show dates might conflict? If you're not a permanent in these bands, how do they remain consistent with gigs if they need to contract their musicians every time they play? And how did you come into contact with these MDs to play with them? So uh, there's a lot to kind of unpack here. Uh, the first thing is the idea of a core fixed band. And actually, I kind of want to step back a little bit from that because the idea of a core fixed band, like a band, kind of speaks to the idea of democracy in music making, democracy in our collective artistic decision making. You have a band and we're all going to make it big and that's great and everything. <clears throat> that's not really the case for a working musician. Democracy doesn't quite work. What you want to have is you want to have a band leader that has a very strong idea of what their musical vision is. They're able to work with side people, side men and women, and all funnel it towards one person's vision of what their music should be. Having a band leader is very important. Now, having a band leader means that you might be able to sub out side people. In, you know, like, for this particular gig, I want this person. For this particular gig, I want this person. There's some, you know, maybe pros and cons to that. For Hannah Sumner, Hannah Sumner really likes to work with the same core group of people for every single gig. So there's some you know trade-off with that. Having the same group of people is great because we can you know play gigs on little to no rehearsal and we know the music really well and we've you know been able to really develop a sound. At the same time if she gets a gig offer and we can't do it then you know hey we she doesn't want to do the gig because she feels so comfortable with this core group of people. On the other hand, if you're a band leader and if you want to be able to switch people in and out, that gives you a lot more flexibility and that's fantastic. But at the same time, it's a lot harder to get people up to speed, even if they're amazing musicians and might require more rehearsal. And it's just kind of a trade off there. Now, what I've found over the years is that people tend to fall in a circle of musicians, people that might play in different projects together and might be mixed and matched a little bit. But you generally know the same group of drummers, same group of guitarists, same keyboard players, same singers. And because of that, it's easier to sub in and out because you know each other's strengths, each other's weaknesses, how each other sound, how to work with one another, what sorts of things you need to give, give them in terms of music. So over time, it becomes a lot easier to do that sub model of being able to grab different people from different projects at the last second and, you know, know that they will rise to the occasion. The Andersops writes, Adam, do you have any thoughts on tinnitus and how it can affect a musician's career? Like, is it too bad or shouldn't I worry about it much? Yeah, tinnitus can be really kind of a pain. And, you know, I've had a little bit of tinnitus in the past. Uh, it's not that bad right now, but I want to try and keep it not that bad. So I kind of mitigate that through either using in-ear monitors or earplugs. And, you know, whenever I'm seeing music live, I try and be very conscious of the noise level. If it's too loud, I try and make sure to always go to the bar and life pro tip, life hack. I'm not sure if this is actually what you're supposed to do, but I grab some tissues, roll them up, stuff them in my ears. Always have that sort of like DIY earplugs. Your ears are the most important thing for you as a musician, and you have to take care of your ears. And long-term exposure to loud music can really, really do a number on your ability to <laughs> express yourself as a musician and also, you know, be able to function as a musician, be able to do your job. So please, kids, 
take care of your ears. You only get two. Tyler Abbott writes, Do you think it's pretentious to call your music or band technical? One of my favorite genres, technical death metal, is littered with amazing bands and players. Erlen Kasperson, the bassist of Spawn of Possession, anyone? Check him out. But I can't think of any other genres that so blatantly label themselves as technical. Do you think that there's a problem with aspiring to write crazy fusion piece or a polyrhythmic prog epic or what have you for the sake of being able to say it's technical? Yeah, I do think that that whole thing is a little bit pretentious, writing something to see how technical you can make it. And, you know, the term technical and also the term progressive, I feel like are fairly like, my music is more progressive than yours. If you try and write something complex for the sake of it being complex, well, you've already lost because there's more music out there that's more complex. So maybe you should think about using that complexity to convey a particular emotion. And once you start thinking about that idea, using the complexity and using these complicated scales and time signatures and whatever, and nested tuplets, using that to evoke a feeling, then you start, you know, creating art. And I can see that a lot of technical death metal or like progressive rock and all that stuff, they use those things. They use the complicated things as a means of creating a sound, as a means of creating a mood or an aesthetic. And that's great. But Remember this, there's always going to be more complicated music out there, so at a certain point, you're going to need to figure out what kind of art you're going to need to make. You know, there's a style of music called new complexity in contemporary classical music, and yeah, it's basically just absurdly complicated nested tuplets and whatever, blah, 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 and odd time signatures, all that nonsense. And uh, definitely check out the music of Brian Ferniho, Ferniho, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, his string quartet number six I was checking out recently, and it's, uh, yeah, it's something. Mr. Rock and Roll, one, two, three, four, five, right? Hey, Adam, I was just accepted into Berkeley, and I will be attending it this fall. But I just learned from a friend of mine that there's a placement audition once I get there. Any advice for it? Keep up the good work. All right, so now we get to one of the more screwed up things about Berkeley, and everybody will now know this and think, oh my God, they do that to you? So when you go into Berkeley, you're given an ensemble audition, or they call it a ratings audition, and you're given a rating out of eight. Basically, you're graded on how well you can play music, and there's like four categories. I forget which each category are. There's like your sight reading ability, your improvisational ability, your, and then it's kind of averaged out, and then that average of everything is your ensemble rating. And that ensemble rating is a number assigned to you basically about how good at music you are. You know, there's a reason for this ensemble number because, you know, if your your rating is four and you have an ensemble that you need to be uh, like level six to get into, that's an easy way of like making sure that the right people are placed together in the right ensemble is the right level so nobody is too egregiously amazing or too terrible in a given ensemble. But, you know, there are some fairly toxic interpersonal relationships that come from that because you're always kind of judging other people based upon their ensemble rating. That said, you know, I know tons of amazing musicians who didn't really give a crap about the ensemble rating process, got a two, graduated with a two, and are some of the most killing musicians that I know. And then, of course, there's some which somehow got like sevens or eights and are, you know, not musicians anymore. That's just one of the things that you're going to have to deal at Berkeley. I'm not really quite sure if other schools do a similar thing. I know at Manhattan School of Music, they definitely did not do that. Um, but yeah, good luck, man. Um, that's all I have to say. Annoy the Fish writes, Here's a challenge for you. How about you try and make some music that doesn't sound like shit? Sure thing. If you'd like to listen to my actual music, please check me out at sungazermusic.bandcamp.com. It's my main band. Also check out massextinctionevent.bandcamp.com. Those are some pieces of music that I'm really proud of, so thank you for bringing that up. Oscar Tadlock writes, Holy crap, have you ever thought about trying to publish some of your stuff academically? Seems like this is something that could be developed into a paper. Yeah, I've thought about like submitting papers to academic journals for sure, and right now I don't really care so much about what music academia thinks of me and what I do. I'm more inclined to make YouTube videos, and I feel like that's going to be a lot more useful for me in the future anyway. It's also, you know, kind of more fun for me because, you know, week after week I can shift my focus to different things. I don't have to get completely bogged down onto one subject that I'm researching. So, yeah, I mean, maybe in the future, but... Uh. Joaquim Ined writes, When playing bass, it is better, almost necessary, to cut your nails. Unfortunately, it will disable you a little bit for guitar. I still have not solved this problem while switching between those two instruments. Do you have any tips? Yeah, Unfortunately, you cannot play electric bass guitar with long nails using typical rest stroke finger style technique. A big part of electric bass technique is flesh on the strings, and that's pretty much exactly the opposite of classical guitar technique. Now, one option that you could 
have at your disposal is cutting your nails real short and using fake nails. I know some classical guitar players use that as sort of an option, but you know, you kind of have to pick one or the other, so. Leon Sebum writes, Adam, I have a question about your bass, not to be stuck up or condescending or something, but why do you play a relatively cheap instrument? I think your P bass is a Mexican Fender if I spotted it right. Aren't you ever desiring something better? Well, honestly, it was a bass that I connected with. And, you know, when I picked it up for the first time at 30th Street Guitars in Manhattan, when it was actually on 30th Street, it's on 27th Street now, I felt like a real connection to it. I felt like the upper register just like sang out in a really particular way that I just really, really enjoyed. And I felt like, hey, this bass is awesome. And it's just a Mexican P bass. I like this bass. I'm not really a person who wants to change what they have just because they notice a couple flaws in it. I like to understand what those flaws are. I like to understand how to work with them and really understand a particular instrument for what it is. For that particular P-Bass, for my particular Mexican P-Bass, I like it quite a lot and so that's the reason why I use it. Would a more expensive P-Bass be technically and objectively better? Perhaps. But I know my bass really well and I'm going to stick with it for the time being. Houston Hilburn writes, Hey, have you ever worked with a cajon player? How do you feel about that instrument in general? So like six and a half years ago when I first moved to New York, it was extremely fashionable for drummers to buy a cajon and play that cajon in acoustic settings. Like whenever you wanted like the stripped down sort of vibe when you had like acoustic guitar, maybe bass and cajon because cajon gets the sound and the sort of general grooves of a full drum set. But you know, it's not as loud and it's way more portable. You got the low sound of the kick drum and then the high sound of the snare drum, basically like the sound and the feel of a full drum set. And it's pretty cool. And as a bass player, you can immediately relate to a cajon player who's a drummer because they're gonna play the cajon pretty much exactly the same way that they would play a drum set. It's a very easy like one-to-one -one transition. Now the cajon isn't quite as trendy and hip as it was back then, but you'll still see it a lot here. Now the trendy hip thing to do, and it has been for a while, is get the SPDSX drum sampling pad. Pretty much every drummer I know has one of those things. It's pretty important now actually to be able to access electronic sounds in a live situation. So that's like the new cajon for like fashionable items that a drummer might need in a working situation in New York City. Parker Knapp writes, Adam, everything I've ever done has been my own. How can I learn from other musicians without straight up learning to play their songs? Because I don't think I could ever do that. I guarantee you what you have done so far is not original. Even if you feel like you have not played any other music from any other person, the stuff that you have been doing so far is a synthesis of what you've heard and kind of a poor synthesis because you haven't been actually like diving in to what other people do, whether it's songwriting, bass playing, guitar playing, learning what they do, trying to deconstruct it, playing it, feeling it, understanding how they're approaching music. When people feel like they aren't advancing musically, it's because they have not gone through the most important sort of creative process. And that creative process is one, imitate, learn what another person does, try and imitate what they do. Two, assimilate, really get that within your musical vocabulary, really get that within your artistry. And then three, innovate, then figure out how all that other material fits within your particular vision. And if you're always just assessed from the get-go with that last step, innovation, you're never really gonna get anywhere because you don't really have the material from which to build your innovation. So please, start with the basics. Start with the imitation. That's extremely important. This is what babies do when they're first learning how to speak. They're imitating sounds that their parents make. And only after they imitate the sounds and then assimilate what the sounds mean, then they're able to innovate new phrases, innovate new sorts of ideas for themselves. But only after that beginning stages of imitation. Leap Leap Music writes, Hey, another question. If you're fine doing it, could you recommend more music education channels? I subscribe currently to you, Samurai Guitarist, Rob Chapman, and a few others. But for other people's sake, since we don't have easy access to music education besides YouTube, what would you recommend? So one channel that I really definitely think you should subscribe to if you think that my channel is at all cool is 12 Tone. It's basically music theory videos done with that sort of Vihart style animation. And they're really, really well done. Definitely check him out. Uh, done by an actual music theorist, not just a guy who likes to spout out nonsense about music theory. Uh, also, definitely check out early music sources. I've been getting a kick out of this one. It's basically 16th century and 17th century music theory, but there's like occasional memes and stuff in there. It's kind of strange how they do it, but I've actually learned a lot because I don't know a whole lot about that style of theory because most music theory that you learn is kind of 18th century and onward. So that's a fun one. Rick Beato is probably the one that you really want to check out if you're into advanced music theory and from a practical band 
He has all sorts of stuff. He goes way more in depth on sort of the more practical side application of the music theory stuff for jazz than I might do on this channel. So Rick Beato is probably the one that a lot of people should definitely check out. Um, also Michael New, uh, Samurai guitarist you mentioned. So yeah, those are some channels you should check out. Jan writes, I agree with you in terms of politics and music. In my opinion, though, political messages should be done subtly and non-preachy. A lot of times you won't make people think just by screaming the message, but by a moral behind the story of the lyrics, maybe. Nobody likes propaganda. So yeah, on the last q and I did this whole thing about how I felt that politics and music should not be kept separate, because music is an important byproduct of the culture from which it comes. You know, of course, that was a fairly controversial statement, and the YouTube comment section exploded with keyboard warriors going nuts on, you know, both sides of the issue. And there were some good points to be made um, that I, fi I feel like I should address for people who feel like politics and music should be kept separate, at least in certain circumstances. And the circumstance that I feel like they should be kept separate is this. If a person makes music and they make art that is not particularly political in nature or culturally relevant in any sort of real meaningful way, they might be given a stage, like on social media or some sort of public forum, to make a political statement. And they might be inclined to make that political statement because they've been given the stage. But, you know, maybe there's this feeling that that stage hasn't been earned to make a political statement. Because if they feel like this important, big political stage like that they have on this social media that can say whatever they want about some sort of important political issue was so important, why didn't they put in all that energy to really craft a musical message, craft a cultural message into the art that they were making, and really letting their statement shine through through that? It feels like it's not thought out that much. For me, it feels like maybe it's a little cheap. So I can understand that. But beyond that, you know, I definitely feel that politics and music go hand in hand. And there's a long history that support my thoughts on that. So there we go. Eugene 12 writes, Hey Adam, love your vids. I got a question though. How does a music career affect your personal life? I mean, I can imagine with the odd and busy schedules, you wouldn't have a lot of time for, I'm assuming, lady friend or even children. Let me know what you think. Sharp sign, bless. I've talked a little bit about this in like a Q&A live streams about the fact that it's very difficult. And if you're going to be with somebody in terms of a romantic partner, you definitely need to have somebody who understands what that is. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing that any other way. Fortunately, I do have a romantic partner who is also a musician. So that definitely helps out a lot. Otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to do what I do and keep the schedule that I do and, you know, maintain some sort of semblance of like sanity within some sort of personal life. DM21865 writes, talk about sucking the joy out of music. Meh. This is what happens when science people try to engage with musical creativity. What a bore. So I'm a science person, apparently. Uh, that's a new one to me. I enjoy science. I enjoy math occasionally in small doses. I enjoy cognitive science. I enjoy learning about the brain. But these are all kind of ancillary to my study of music. I'm using these, you know, extracurricular sorts of understandings of the world to try and bolster my understanding of a holistic view on music. And I do this because, you know, I have a lot of training. I don't mean to say that, like, as a, I'm boasting that I have a lot of training. I, you know, I have a graduate degree. A lot, a lot of years spent in upper academia studying music. And I always felt that there was a big disconnect somewhere along the way, because we learned all sorts of crazy stuff involving like 12 tone rows and blah, 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 all sorts of theory, all sorts of ear training and all that. But I always felt like there, there was something more fundamental about the music making that we were doing in school that like, eh, there might be other sort of academic subjects that might give more meaning to the music. And then because the music has more meaning, they might sort of resonate more deeply with more people. And it certainly has resonate, music has resonated a lot more deeply with me since I've started understanding it in terms of things that I didn't understand it in school, like in terms of language, linguistics, in terms of math, ratios, and frequencies, in terms of acoustics, in terms of all these things that people more viscerally feel music by than necessarily like uh, you know, whether a chord is a major seven or a minor seven. That's important too. Those sorts of labels are very important, but there's other ways of understanding music besides the general music theory that you might learn in school. And I think that's kind of a general running theme in my channel is alternative ways of looking at music. It might be kind of extreme, might be kind of weird, but things that might hopefully inspire people to look at music slightly differently from what they're used to. So no, I'm not a science person. I might deliver my subject matter in the sort of like a science popularizer way of like Bill Nye or whatever. Uh, that's not what I do. I'm a musician first and foremost. 
That's what my day job is. So I hopefully am not, you know, not inspiring people. Hopefully I'm not sucking the fun out of music for anybody. Hopefully I'm inspiring people to look at music in new and interesting ways. Astro Lincoln writes, Hey Adam, are you strictly a two finger player or do you use three to four occasionally? Strictly two fingers. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching Question and Answer Time with Adam Neely, number 29. Question and Answer Time, number 29. If you enjoy what I do here on this channel, please consider commenting, liking, and subscribing. Definitely consider clicking that ring button. I do have a new video coming out every Monday, but occasionally I have different things coming out throughout the week. And one of the reasons why I have additional content coming out throughout the week is because of these lovely folks and fellows and fellowettes down here who have uh, subscribed to my Patreon. It's through their support and their continued uh, generous donations that I'm able to do this week after week and do all the bonus content. So I'm very thankful for everybody who subscribed to my Patreon. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Um, yeah, and uh, until next time. <clears throat> Peace.